Hi, my name is Tracy Takahama Espinosa, and I want to talk about the elephant in the room today. I want to talk about some things that everybody in society knows about related to education, either implicitly and consciously. But until we bring some of these things to the forefront, until we talk about them in a really clear way, we won't be able to advance education in the ways that we would hope to. So in the short video, I want to do three things. I want to first talk about four big changes that have occurred um, on the educational landscape within society over the past decade that necessarily impact and change the way that we train teachers to be teachers and what we expect of teachers in society. Uh, second, I want to talk about some very specific recommendations on um, teachers' new pedagogical knowledge that comes out of the OECD publication from 2017, which recommends that new teacher formation has to include a lot of different types of things. The two basic ones are more information about the brain and how it learns and technology. And the third thing I want to do is to leave you with some really concrete starter ideas, the principles and tenets for mind, brain, and education science that should guide teacher practice from here on out. So what are these big necessary changes in education? Do you remember Rip Van Winkle? You know, he fell asleep for like a hundred years. And what happened in that time when he woke up, you know, transportation had totally changed. And the way we do business um, is very, very different now than it was a hundred years ago. Um, and the way we elect people into office has also changed drastically. Where we get our food from, how we shop, how we feed ourselves has also changed. And our schools, Okay, this isn't so drastic. Okay, one yes, definitely uh, we have some schoolhouses that still look like this. This one, obviously, very extreme Amish community in Pennsylvania, so maybe that's uh, pushing the point. But the key idea here is that schools are the slowest institutions to change in society, and we have a lot of catch-up work to do. And we're pushed to do this not only because everybody else is changing, but also because there are different expectations of schools. We now go from this idea of equal access, almost everybody gets to go to school now, but they don't always get the same level of quality. Depending on their school district, their zip code, people are sort of condemned to a type of education. That has to change, right? We're moving from teaching in silos, like teaching uh, math, language, science, art as separate concepts, to understanding the value of transdisciplinary thinking. And we're moving from just looking towards standards, let's meet the average, to really more creativity on the part of our students. And from this idea of just passing a class to this concept of lifelong learning, from traditional resources, textbooks basically, to using technology in intelligent ways in our classroom. From bettering um, just the self before we used to think that you know you go to school and you can have a better life. We know that. That's absolutely true. We know that somebody who finishes high school learns about twice as much as somebody who only finishes primary school. And somebody who goes to college earns about twice as much as somebody who went to high school. And somebody who has a master's or a PhD is almost never unemployed. So we know there's benefits to the individual. But we also now accept and recognize that when individuals in society flourish, then society as a whole flourishes. We've also moved from just content knowledge, you know, knowing a particular math formula or a grammatical rule or a form and language, to understanding how to think about approaching problems in our, in our surroundings. And we've also moved from these face-to-face -face brick and mortar classrooms with solid walls to understanding things like virtual classrooms that take advantage of the flipped classroom, for example, in which you send video content beforehand and then when you're in class you can really go deeper into the information. And I'm sure there's other changes, but these are some really core shifts in expectations of schools. A second big change has to do with not only changes in school expectations, but also what do we expect of students and what do we expect of teachers. If you cumulatively look at the 21st century literature out there that says what is it that we hope that we do in classrooms, you'll get this idea that we want critical and creative thinkers, we want people who know how to work with people who are different from them, uh, who know how to use tools or who embrace technology or who uh, understand and appreciate complexity and who are innovative. This means that we are no longer just looking at understanding history or math or reading or writing as subject areas, but we expect that students come out of our systems being able to act autonomously, to be responsible citizens, um, to be open and empathetic and be able to work with people who are different from them. This puts a huge burden on the teacher, right? Because you can't get apples from a pear tree. If this is what we expect of students, then we as teachers have to be this 
and more. So we have to embrace that and we have to identify our own shortcomings perhaps and fill in those gaps. A third change that has occurred is the way that technology has opened up our, our better understanding about the brain. We're still in diapers. We still know very little about the human brain, but what we do know is allowing us, for example, to get rid of all of these myths. Back in the 90s, before we could really see into the brain very clearly, we would do cartoon sketches and oftentimes overgeneralize information or misinterpret scientific findings. And all of these things that you see here have now been proven to be myths. So slightly better technology helps us understand that we can measure brain activity, um, either electrically or chemically or structurally. And all of these things together now give us this deeper appreciation that, you know, it's not that you just have, you know, math in one part of the brain or a spatial or creativity in another. That's not true. You have very complex neural networks that are formed for any type of skill set that, that you learn or undertake. So doing something as simple as, you know, saying a sentence or a basic math problem will involve multiple areas of the brains. And so where we used to think uh, language was located or math was located, now we understand these are core hubs. You know, information passes through those places, but it's not where language or math is. And so this refined uh, technology has helped us get a more sophisticated understanding and appreciation of all of the complex ways that people learn. And in doing so, it also permits us to be much more precise. Instead of saying that, uh, well, the kid just doesn't have a brain for math, we can actually break it down and we can say, oh my gosh, he doesn't understand you know, magnitude or how symbols relate to certain procedures in a mathematical formula or whatever. So we're now able to become more precise in understanding what types of difficulties kids might have in our classrooms. The fourth big change is that we also now have better insight into what really influences student learning outcomes. And this is thanks to uh, longitudinal studies. Finally, you know, formal education is only around 120, 30 years old. So finally, we now have studies that can track whole cohorts of people since the time that they enter education all the way until they graduate over time. So we can actually see what types of interventions seem to work with what types of individuals and what types of contexts. So we can compare them across the lifespan. We also have internationally comparative studies. So we can sort of sort out now what types of things are really true for all human brains? And then what things have a very heavy cultural component uh, attached to them, especially as they relate to cultural artifacts like uh, language and how we write numbers or letters. And thirdly, we now have a methodologically comparative scale, thanks in great part to the work of John Hattie, who has really been tremendous and has opened our eyes to understanding that if you compare influences on student learning, you can weigh this now as to its effect size. So what has a greater effect? What has a greater impact on student learning outcomes? So he's tabulated to find that, you know, a point uh, four has a, this basic, you know, sweet spot effect. Anything above that is really where we want to be. Um, and you can compare things like you can say, yeah, homework is important. You know, it, it makes sense. But um, actually, there's a bunch of other things that are even more important, like the student teacher relationship has a huge or a much bigger effect size than homework does, for example. So you sort of have to choose your battles. What's the most important thing that we should be focusing on when we teach teachers? Do we teach them how to grade homework? or emphasize their time there, or do we tell them, you know, your time is better spent cultivating those strong student-teacher relationships? Um, so we can compare multiple things, teaching explicit study skills, or how uh, teacher clarity and feedback uh, aids learning, or how interactive discussions, getting students to actually use the information, the knowledge, as opposed to just doing a worksheet, how does that influence their learning outcomes? Um, and maybe most importantly, how a student's own Self-expectation, you know, I am a learner or, you know, I'm not going to be good at this. Um, how the student's own self-perception as influenced by what the teachers make them think about himself uh, changes that student's outcome. So based on Hattie's work, we're able to now not only have these longitudinal studies, international studies, but now we have methodolo methodologically comparative scales where we can actually say certain things really have a bigger impact for most of the students in our classroom. Another big idea that aids us in thinking about this idea of our end game in education is when we think about um, backward design, when we think about anything that a student is going to learn in our classrooms can be broken down into competencies. Either um, it's a knowledge-based thing, it's dates, facts, formulas, concepts, place names, or it's a skill set, how to use that knowledge, or it's related to attitudinal things. You know, 
uh, appreciating um, the role of perseverance in finding the right answers or um, uh, valuing teamwork to get to the right answers. So understanding that a teacher's job is no longer just here, no longer in just sharing knowledge. Um, it has more to do with this bigger area of skill sets and attitudinal ranges. And that's something that we have to get beyond because our textbooks are only telling us what to teach. They're not telling us how to teach. And the how seems to be what we, what society values much more um, as far as what a school's role is in shaping those individuals. We're going to be citizens uh, in our own communities. So this really forces us to think, you know, at the end of the day, what is that end result? You know, what are my objectives? What is it that I'm after uh, in my day to day with my interaction with my students or in across the whole, you know, seventh grade school year or primary school or by the time they hit university? What is it that I'm trying to produce? Then I have to ask myself, what is it that I am hoping to achieve as a teacher? What is it that I'm after? Then I have to decide, you know, what are the tools then that are most appropriate for measuring that? And then after that, I can decide, okay, now what do I do in my classroom? We spend a lot of time in professional development talking about activities, you know, what methodology, what strategy, what way to, what trick to use within our classroom setting. Uh, and we spend very little time focused on how to determine those objectives. That's probably the more important end game if we think about this um, more globally. Uh, going back to this whole point, if we're hoping, if the expectations of society are that we're producing students that are critical and creative thinkers, for example, do we actually really have the correct tools to measure that? Does a standardized multiple choice test really get to this kind of a profile? Probably not. So we really have to rethink what it is that we're doing in education these days. Another core reason to remember and think about this, the structure, is because attitudinal changes are perhaps the most important across the lifespan of an individual as far as um, you know, future learning goes. But they also take the longest time to form. And it's also very important to remember that attitudes are really connected to these unconscious prejudices that many of us have um, about how we think people learn. So if I was brought up with the idea or told uh, over and over again that girls just don't have a head for math or they're not good at math or science or whatever it is, if I have that as a belief, then I actually interact and treat girls differently in my classroom. We now have sufficient evidence to really say, you know, declaratively, this is a problem. Teachers' prejudices about how intelligence is formed, how people learn, influence student learning outcomes. And these are silly things like, you know, if only the parents were more responsible or had better genes and passed them on to their kids, or if only the kids were better behaved, or if only I had better resources, if only they'd eaten breakfast at home or they'd slept better, or if only my classes were smaller, or if only the kids played less video games, ah, then I would be this great teacher, right? So we have these, these excuses that, that actually trump what we now know about student learning outcomes. There is no single greater individual factor that influences student learning outcomes than the quality of the teacher. So we know that the kid could have a kind of messed up uh, home life and, and I might have a slightly larger class than the other guy. And yeah, this year I particularly do have uh, some troublemaking kids in the classroom or whatever it is. But guess what? That's on me. And actually, I have more power than I think to change this. And to quantify this, I confirmed looking at Hattie's work and um, asking him, you know, it seems that there's 15 core teacher attitudes that are coming out of all of this research. What do you think? And he says, yeah, it looks good. Uh, makes sense. It makes sense to think that if teachers don't understand their own power, that they don't understand that they are the decisive factor in the classroom, Teacher attitudes do change student learning outcomes. So if a teacher doesn't believe in the importance of teamwork and believing humbly, you know, the student has a good idea, I have a good idea, the minute we're sharing these ideas, we have an even better idea. If the teacher doesn't understand that, um, then that teacher will become better, but he will never be great. If a teacher doesn't understand how important it is to develop autonomy in learning, that, that they are not paid to answer kids' questions. They're paid to get kids to think. If teachers don't buy into that, it's very hard for them to become excellent in their endeavors. If teachers don't lower this you know, threshold of angst that people have about evaluation and don't, don't begin to embrace evaluation as a form of teaching, it's not meant to judge people. It's meant to help them identify their own gaps in learning. If we don't change that chip that we have about evaluation, we're never going to have those great schools that we're after.
We also know that it's part of great teachers' attitudes to be able to differentiate and to value uh, inclusive education and understand that not all kids need exactly the same thing at exactly the same moment and that that's on us to be able to vary our instructional methods or the way we approach information with students in order to start at their starting point and provide them with all the resources they need in order to reach the same level of expectations that we have for all. Another important attitude is to appreciate that the objective of modern education is to really hopefully form lifelong lovers of learning, people who just find it a kick to learn new things all the time, instead of stamping into them that they have to pass a certain uh, test or exam. It's also very important that we appreciate um, our role as models. Uh, you can't get apples from a pear tree. If we expect that students are autonomous in their own learning, uh, we have to be autonomous. If we expect that students know how to use a variety of tools to resolve problems, we have to be able to do that. If we expect that students are able to work with people who are different from them, we have to be able to show them that we can do that as well. Being a model is key to being an excellent teacher. My job is to also appreciate that I have very unique individuals in my class, and they come from a, a variety of backgrounds. And some of them come from starting points that are you know, more elevated than others. They've had other resources or extra benefits at home that other kids don't. And part of my job is to remediate the negative effects that some kids might come to school with. That is on me to try to do that. And also to appreciate that it's usually not the kid's fault <laughs> that they are in that situation. And that's something that we have to uh, compassionately accept as we teach this huge range of kids that, that will be in our classroom. It's also really important that I begin to learn more about the brain because it's important to understand that the brain cannot not learn. That's the whole reason it exists, right? So if I can appreciate that kids can and will learn, um, they just might do it at different paces. That creates this aura of optimism within every single classroom context that I enter. And many of you have worked with uh, Carol Dweck's idea of growth mindsets. This is really embracing the idea that intelligence is definitely fluid. It's not fixed. You are not trapped in your biology. You can make more of yourself than you think. So helping kids to appreciate that is also very powerful. It's also important to embrace this idea that there is a huge variability within humanity where there's a lot of different people out there, right? There's going to be a percentage of people in the world that have, you know, these differing kinds of brains. And that's on me to learn how to work with those kids and integrate them. I'm responsible for all of teachers have to buy into that idea. Another attitudinal shift has to do with professional knowledge. Back in the day, it was enough to know a lot of stuff. Now, it's more important that teachers not only know stuff, which you can find on your phone, but it's actually more important to understand the workings of the human brain. How do people learn? So knowing a bit more about the brain is a responsibility on the teacher. The human brain, the organ of all of our existence as teachers, is not simple. Therefore, solutions in the classroom can't be like three steps to student reading or something like that. And it's not as simple as saying, oh, you have a right brain and a left brain. That's just not true. Um, we have to get away from these misunderstandings about how humans learn and to dive into a little bit more of the complexity, how people learn different things, to understand, you know, that there are multiple networks, that all of those pieces are in slightly different neural pathways. And the more teachers know about that, the better they can become at deciphering what learning problems individuals have. And that's on us. That's part of our attitudinal shift as far as teachers' professional knowledge these days. It's also very important to see this as a shift in how we understand teachers now in society. Perhaps the most revered profession in society are medical doctors, and I'd have to say that teachers share the same first rule as doctors, and that is to do no harm. This means that all of our practice has to be evidence-based. We really have to look at what the science now says about learning in order to choose our, the best teaching interventions. It's also very important that teachers accept they have an awesome responsibility, but also understanding just from a, from a social neurocognitive perspective to understand that this link, this connection, this the communication that we have with individual students, when they believe we care about their learning, makes a huge difference. It's also very important that teachers understand this huge and awesome responsibility that we have for creating the right environment for student learning. We know that the teacher 
not the family, has the greatest impact on the individual student as far as their own self-belief in their value as learners. I can do this. I will be able to do that. They totally believe you as a teacher more than they believe mom and dad as far as their own potential within your classroom. We don't understand our power. And this has a lot to do with this area of neuroscience called social contagion that I hope we can dig into deeper with you later. It's also vital that teachers, you know, rather than shooting for this lowest common denominators, teachers understand that students reach the level of expectations placed on them. So aiming high is actually a really good idea. Finally, it's often hard for us to accept because it means, you know, owning and, and having a huge responsibility. I am the decisive factor in the classroom. I decide, you know, this climate here. I decide whether or not this is going to be a joyful encounter or if this is going to be something that's you know, heavy and burdensome or a dictatorship or authoritative kind of an experience, it's, it's on me. It's on me to decide that. So these 15 core attitudes are things that I'd like you to think about and reflect on because if you are not 100% you know, in agreement, I am that, I can do that, I believe that, um, then we have some stuff to work on because we know that while you can get professional development in you know certain methodology or how to plan a class or do an activity or whatever, you can become better at being a teacher, but you will never be great if those core teacher attitudes aren't in place. And this moves us from just being an educator to moving towards being a learning scientist. And this is a big shift now in teaching. It is something that was forecasted more than 30 years ago by Leslie Hart, who said designing educational experiences without an understanding of the brain is like designing a glove without understanding the human hand. Basically, if you don't know enough, or a little bit, at least the basics about how humans learn, um, we can fall into these areas of great misconception. But the main problem is that research led in great part by uh, Paul Howard Jones just shows that across the globe, most teachers do not know enough about the brain. New teacher education would be not only understanding all these things about education, but being a mind-brain education scientist means that you also understand things about consciousness and how emotions influence learning and the role of memory and attention systems. So all of these things are a part of new teacher education. So while it's still acceptable that some people say, oh, no, no, I'm just an educator, you know, okay, but I'd like to make the argument that there's a real need for people who understand, who get this, who are mind-brain education scientists, not just educators, but people who understand how the rest of the learning sciences really influence our brain. Why? Because we have studied the learning brain for about 150 years, um, but we barely know anything about how to teach based on that information. This is really changing the face of educational training, whereas before teachers might learn a bit about how people learn, and now we need to get to the point of, okay, no, how do you take advantage of how the brain learns to teach better? What are those precise interventions that are most important? And the reason that I argue that this is important to do is because, you know, we have not figured it out yet. And education is so complex. And so we're, every single school year, we begin with this optimistic view of, okay, this year I'm going to figure it out, or this year it's all going to work. And there's a lot that is still unknown. So unless we begin to nurture our profession, education, uh, with information from the other learning sciences, uh, we will not come to those conclusions. And I say this because mind-brain education science takes all of the information from the learning sciences. For, so understanding how nutrition or sleep influences the brain, to understanding the basics of, of neuroscience and how there are chemical changes that occur in the brain in different types of human development, and mixing all of this with information from education, from psychology, from understanding just how historical or cultural context influence things. And then moving into this idea of not just educational neuroscience, but to this new field of mind-brain education science, which is this kind of sweet spot in the middle that looks at the teaching elements that we can gain. Can we take all of this information and now be more effective teachers in our classroom? And I believe we can. So this means combining Hattie's work with mind-brain education into a new type of teacher's professional development scheme. We are the only profession out there that really still continues to, to go without rank. And that's very democratic, but it's a bit problematic because somebody who is fresh out of teacher's college um, is a teacher. And somebody who's been teaching for 45 years and is brilliant uh, is still a teacher. Uh, we'd like to recommend that you can sort of sort this out to saying, okay, somebody is a newly formed teacher to being a novice, proficient, expert, 
And then hopefully we get a handful of people who end up being master teachers. This happens over time, but also more importantly, over depth of knowledge. It doesn't mean that only old people can be master teachers. You can have really young people who are great master teachers when they have the greater depth of understanding of our new profession. And all of this comes back to the recommendations that were made by the OECD expert panel on teachers' new pedagogical knowledge and the changes that are occurring in education, the changes in expectations of society, but how we need to change teacher formation. So to summarize, that the first steps that we would suggest is that number one is to get rid of the neuro myths and to correct teacher attitudes. The second step would then be looking at these core principles. What are these things that we know that are true about all human brains? And believe it or not, there's only six. Okay, And then things that are tenants, that are also true, but they have huge human variation. Things like, um, for example, motivation influences student learning, but what motivates one person doesn't motivate another. So we know that it's important for learning, but it doesn't work the same way for all human brains. Then we also have to take into consideration cultural aspects and the context within which learning occurs. And then, finally, then we can reach, you know, here are some core recommendations of how you should teach in the new modern classroom that includes mind brain education science. So these would be the steps that we'd recommend. If we were to look at some of the things on this first uh, step, many teachers say, oh, but my attitudes are just fine. I don't believe in any neuromyths. I'd ask you to look at this list, you know. I have a list of more than 70 neuromyths that are in teacher literature. Um, do you believe any of them? And if you do, we got to correct that. And we got to get the better information in there because the main reason neural myths are so bad is that they do harm. They actually limit the way that we consider potential in individual students. So I'd love to be able to pull apart neural myths with you at some point. My book from the summer of 2018 is, is one that actually summarizes all these myths, but I'd love to go over them with you. So going back to this general list, then okay, so once we get rid of the myths, then we have to know what real content information is really good. To get that answer, I did a 10-year follow-up to another study that was done in 2008 to um, try to figure out, is there anything that we can all agree on uh, from neuroscience that can be brought into the classroom? The Delphi panel of experts was asked six different questions. And the important things that I'm going to share right now only have to do with the principles and the tenets. So there's six principles that they agreed upon. They agreed that the human brain is unique. Everybody has an individual brain. While we might have similar neural pathways for, for example, how humans learn to read, nobody has identical pathways for how they do that. The second principle has to do with different potentials. You are born with a different set of potential capacities to do different types of skill sets. Thanks to the genes that you inherit, combined with this dynamic of your environment, those things together decide who you become and what you can learn. So this means that the context of learning, prior experiences, your personal choice, you know, free will, as well as your genetic makeup, your biology, um, all the events that occur um, in early childhood and beyond, all make a difference in what you are now able to learn. Different brains have different potentials. A third principle has to do with the basic law of learning that all new learning passes through this filter of prior experience. So basically, the more you know, the more you can know. What you know from your past actually influences what you're potentially able to know in the future. And, you know, and knowing that, how does that change what you do in your classroom? Do you know your students well enough, for example, to take advantage of their prior knowledge? Fourth, the brain changes constantly with experiences. Changes at the molecular level in your brain can actually change before you can see changes in behavior. For example, changes have to occur at the molecular level before a, person, a kid can learn to read, right? Um, you have to have so many different neural networks in place before, boom, one day he seems to read. But the changes at the molecular level occurred way before the changes in behavior of reading, right? So we know that changes in the brain can either occur before behavioral changes simultaneously or even after behavioral observation is seen, okay? So if you know that the brain changes constantly with experience, this makes us question, you know, the, the timing that we have in our school systems. Do we allow for this learning cycle to run its natural course? The fifth principle has to do with the general plasticity of the brain. The brain is plastic throughout the lifespan. And we also know that uh, neuroconstructivism explains to us that you have to have basic foundational concepts before other concepts can occur. But do we as teachers have those expectations clear? And do we realize that the order of events is actually more important than saying, oh, but the kid, oh, he's 15, by now he should be doing X, Y, or Z. 
Well, the truth of the matter is, if he doesn't have those basic foundations, then we can't construct that new knowledge. So we know that plasticity really is the physical manifestation of all learning, right? So for plasticity to occur, we have to have the right conditions. And the sixth principle is that there is no learning without well-functioning memory systems and well-functioning attention systems. And memory is not a single thing in the brain, nor is attention. There are multiple subsystems and sub-networks. And teachers really need to know how to take advantage of that. Getting a kid's attention by flicking the lights on and off is not the same thing as sustaining their attention long enough for them to read a page, right? So we have to understand the different types of attention systems, the different types of memory systems, in order to be able to take advantage of this in the best way possible. So those are the six principles. Attached to the six principles are an additional 21 tenets, which are things that are true about every brain, but they range very widely by individual. So there is a great variability um, across humanity. But we do know, for example, that motivation influences student learning outcomes. We also know that affect and cognition are inextricably linked. There is no cognitive development without affect. That means emotion influences how you think about things. We know that stress, for the good or the bad of it, influences student learning outcomes. Anxiety also influences learning. Depression can greatly impede learning as well. And that challenge and threat are vital to learning. But what, what challenges one person could be a threat to another person. So understanding that, that sweet spot of tension is very important for student learning outcomes. We also know that people interpret and react to facial expressions unconsciously. So there are a handful of facial expressions, six or seven, that universally people react to the same. Happiness, sadness, surprise, those seem to be similar. But then there's other micro-expressions that are oftentimes not easily interpreted on a very conscious level. But we send messages to kids all the time, every day, with our face. But very rarely are we taught how to manage those. Kids will hone in onto that facial expression more than the content of what is being expressed. So we know that we have to learn to manage our facial expressions in the right way to be able to enhance those learning uh, moments. In a very similar way, tones of voices are interpreted uh, almost immediately for threat. Are we attuned to that when we interact with our students? Uh, we also know that learning is very social. Most people would choose to learn with others. And there's a huge piece of this that has to do with social contagion, the way that individuals in a group make the group feel about their own context. Another tenant is that, that we know that attention systems can oftentimes also be highly individualized based on different experiences in that individual's lifespan. We also know that learning um, is a progression. It's kind of like, you know, going up a spiral staircase, you know, two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back. It is not a linear process. So it doesn't go from A to B, you know, very directly. So we have to appreciate the time that it takes for learning to occur. We also know that there's conscious as well as unconscious processes. This means you can't learn while you're asleep, obviously, but you can rehearse things. Um, and there is a consolidation of memory when you are asleep. So while teachers might not have control over some of these things, it's very important that they understand the role of the mind-body connection there. We mentioned this in abbreviated form before, but when we talk about chronological ages or cognitive stages or an individual's prior experience, we know that by far prior experience has a greater influence on student learning outcomes than, for example, the age of an individual. Going back to this mind-body connection, we know that what you do to your body influences the potential of your brain, and but your brain chooses what you do to your body, right? So we have to take into consideration the role of sleep and dreaming. Do we understand how sleep allows us to pay attention, how dreaming consolidates memory? Do we know that nutrition, you know, your brain is using about 20% of the calories that you intake, but not all calories are created equal. You know, so eating a bunch of cola and fries does not do the same thing for your brain as eating a healthy diet, right? And we know that physical activity has an influence on what your brain is able to do, right? So, you know, mente sana, corpo sana, you know, there's a balance there between what happens to your body and what happens to your brain. Another tenet is to use it or lose it. We know that your brain is incredibly uh, efficient, and so when neural pathways uh, are not used or rehearsed over time, um, they can degenerate. So unless you're actively using your brain, you're actually not going to sustain whatever it is that you learned in the past. So staying up to date or keeping up to date with information, thinking is one of the best ways to maintain brain fitness.
Most teachers understand the important role of feedback and student learning outcomes for the good or the bad of it, but there's this art in how you give feedback. Is it structured in such a way that the student then owns it rather than becomes defensive by it? Have we honed in on those, those communication skills that are necessary to be able to give the right level and type of feedback in the right way to students to enhance their learning? We also know that the success of authentic learning is explained a great deal in the fact that you cannot not pay attention when you are the center of attention. So when something is authentic, when you are doing it, uh, it makes it very difficult for you not to pay attention to that. It also means that it has a great intrinsic motivational value because it's something of great importance to you already. So, But how do teachers tap into that? Also very important tenet. And finally, we realize because of the brain's efficiency, the first thing it does is it looks for anything, a pattern. What do I already know about this new information that's coming in? And then, what is it that's different? So what sticks out is something that's different to me. So understanding novelty and patterns is a key way that the brain detects information and can learn. So these principles and tenets are the few basic things that come out of neuroscience laboratories that can be used in the classroom. But just knowing that list of things is not enough. What's really, really vital for us to understand is that having that information doesn't empower us to know how to use it in the classroom. So we need to now go beyond understanding that, you know, motivation is important for learning to understand how do we motivate individual kids. So now, in conclusion, this is just sort of laying the groundwork then. We know that there have been changes in education. We know that now there's different expectations. We now know that teachers really need to know a bit more about the brain so that they can actually be more efficient in their jobs. So this is an invitation to explore this mind-brain education science perspective, this take on uh, new teachers' pedagogical knowledge in the 21st century and how do we approach that. So to conclude, I would just ask you to do a short exercise, three, two, one. Are there three things that I mentioned to you that you didn't know beforehand? Are there two things that you will continue to research or talk about because, wow, that was pretty cool. I want to know more about this. Are you curious about anything? And is there at least one thing that you might consider doing differently to improve your personal and professional practice based on the information that we shared right now? Um, why do I ask you to do this? One of the things that we understand about memory consolidation, and remember, memory is vital to all new learning, is that you need time for reflection. Education is not just bombarding people with content information. You also need downtime. You need to process it. You need to think a little bit more and decide, is this usable knowledge? What can I do with this? So getting to that point is part of these types of reflections. If you also like, you might also do a visible thinking activity that comes from Richard and colleagues' ideas and just tell yourself, well, I used to think teacher education or professional development was whatever, whatever. And now I think. Um, this is a different way of putting this information into perspective because it also shows, you know, concrete growth. Uh, before I was here and now I am here with this information. But take the time. Take two minutes to do this. And I promise you it will make a big difference in the way you approach the information in the future. So now, I hope I am leaving you with a whole lot more questions than answers right now. Um, I want to invite you to stay in touch. And I would like to follow up with you to talk about each of, and every one of these points in more depth um, if we get the opportunity. Thanks for the chance to introduce this idea of mind-brain education science and to talk about that elephant in the room and the changes that are necessary to improve our educational practice.